I can I will never forget some of the grossest pieces of footage that came out of Iraq. Like, remember when they fucking rolled a tank over that one dude's car, like the taxi driver's taxi, just for no fucking reason. I wonder if they'll show it here. Oh my lord, dude. It's just like such a perfect uh way to to capture like the the American lack of decency, the the absolute barbarism demonstrated by these fucking corn-fed dickheads. Holy shit. It is a perfect metaphor. Exactly. They're just trying to pay for college, though? Okay, well, you know, you can suck my dick, and I'll give you money to pay for college then. How about that? Get the fuck out of here, dude. Come on. Jesus Christ. I'm not going to fucking excuse that behavior ever. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, yeah, this, there, there you go. This guy's just there trying to pay for college, chat. when we arrived. And when we came across soldiers, they didn't seem sure of their role. That child don't need to be here. No school deal. Okay, school. that's what he need to be doing, not following you. We filmed these GIs after they caught a group of Iraqis stealing wood. We try to stop them from looting, they don't understand, so we'll take their car and we'll crush it. United States Army, tankers, who? That's your tax dollars, by the way. Thank you for your service, sirs. I think there's better ways to pay off college debt. That's what I'm saying. And the irony is they fucking broke the wood, too. Like, that wood's now... The wood pallets are now unusable, too. So, like, it is literally a perfect way to showcase just, like... How malicious, how awful this fucking invasion was. How barbaric these fucking pieces of shit were. Holy shit, dude. That's why a lot of people, especially people that live in like, um, especially people that live in like the third world, you know what I mean? That is like, Seen the the long dick of the American might, the mighty American military have you know, a lot of uh, a lot of things to say. Like it's hard for them to at least even empathize with the dude who has PTSD after doing this shit. You know what I mean? Just like it's hard. It's hard for a lot of people to to look at this and go, "Oh man, that's like totally valid." Uh, uh, you know that guy was just trying to pay. Uh, for a college education. Half the reason why that guy can't pay for a fucking college education is because every single dollar that that guy makes is going to, uh, a chunk of it is going to go to the American, the American, uh, you know, coffers that end up sending other people that look exactly like him out there to do the same shit all over again. <laughs> That's what you get when you loot. Later, the car's owner told us, I'm a taxi driver. The car was my livelihood. Yeah. Um, that's what you get when you loot, said the American soldier. The American soldier said, that's what you get when you loot. Motherfucker, what are you doing in Iraq? What is your purpose for being in Iraq? What do you think you're doing? On the other side of the world. You're looting. That's why you're there. That's crazy. It is literally no different than what colonizers did originally, okay? It's like identical. We all talk about how when we're going to go home, how proud we're going to be to be combat vets. I mean, how many people can say they're, they're combat veterans? You know, 19 years old, I fought in a war. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Nothing can beat that. That's the coolest yeah. thing in the world, you know? It'll be fun to look. By the way, the officer's program is identical in, in the way that it, in, in its inception, not this guy. This guy's clearly a fucking grunt, okay? This is a crayon eater, okay? On the other hand, like, this is the, the colonial equivalent of this is the fucking surf that is like, forced into uh, to action by some fucking lordship, right? 
On the other hand, the officer's program is exactly the same as like the lords that would also send uh, their their uh, sons when they when they were of age to become a man. You know what I mean? You got to fucking scalp a couple tribal people and then you like become a man. You're you're obviously protected from like the absolute worst aspects of war. Like you're not actually throwing your fucking body. This guy is throwing his body. He's like He's, he's just going out. He's not a conscript, obviously, because we don't have that. But it's the, the poverty draft in some ways, right? He's like, this is my upward social mobility. But also, on top of that, it's like, uh, it, it's also, you know, a lie that was sold to him post 9-11. A lot of people were lied to, and they were just so fucking, uh, uh, you know, ripped up in a frenzy to go out there and do what they thought was the right thing. And especially in Iraq, a lot of them realize, like, why the fuck are we here? These motherfuckers don't know what 9-11 is. They don't even know. They don't know what America is half the fucking time. Why are we here? The poverty draft is not largely a myth. I hate that argument. Obviously, a big chunk of the uh, military, uh, the, the, the grunts that uh, make up the, the large chunk of the military, yes, uh, a lot of them are you know, military family members. That's a huge part of it, okay? But the idea that these guys are not doing, there is no poverty draft is a silly one. I hate that. I know there's studies conducted on it, studies conducted on it or whatever, that ultimately come to the realization that like, yeah, if you're a fucking middle-class family, if you're in a literal middle-class family, okay, that then, then you're technically not a part of the poor, the working poor. That's literally it. That's what, that's what people always say. Meanwhile, while you are having that back and forth conversation with me, the American government is sending all of their most predatory fucking uh, recruiters to the blackest of neighborhoods, to the fucking brownest of neighborhoods, to the poorest of neighborhoods. Why the fuck are they doing that? Why do you think they're doing that? They know what they're doing. And you're over here being like, oh, actually, the poverty draft is a bit of a myth. Like, no, it's not. It's not a fucking myth. Yeah, they're sending them to high schools in literally some of the shittiest parts of the country that was left that way on purpose, by design, so you could have a nice pool of fucking slave labor in the criminal justice system. And those who don't get into the system at an early age get to go to the military. Yeah, saying poverty draft is a myth and bitching about how college is too expensive and puts people in lifelong debt. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's not a myth. There are a lot of people who joined the military because their family members were a part of it, okay? That's a huge part of it as well. A lot of people. A lot of people join because their mom and dad or their mom or their dad was a part, okay? Having said that, however, uh, you know, there is plenty of people who do get uh, sold a lie. 9-11 was a huge reason Obviously, that's the reason why, like, uh, the military has gotten diminishing returns on their recruitment tactics since 9-11. That was, like, the most effective military uh, uh, recruitment technique. Uh, like, so many of the people that are veterans in here now that are, are uh, you know, uh, truly upset about the actions that they engaged in, no matter how indefensible, a lot of those people joined, including Pat Tillman, after 9-11. They got whipped up into a fucking frenzy. I'm sure that this is what uh, will be covered here look now. Look back on it. I'm just waiting to get to that point where I can look back on it. <laughs> I have no sympathy for those cry bully and talk about their PTSD if they are in favor of continuing America's atrocities, okay? But there are plenty of wonderful veteran groups like About Face and many other organizations that comprise of veterans who now have made it their lives mission to actively combat continued warfare mike prisoner is another great example of this there are plenty of members in this community as well okay so understand that um like you know there are there are uh, some very valid some good allies in in that in that uh fight knowing better is a veteran uh he's he's great you know there's a lot of people that uh, learned their lesson the hard way. Obviously, you can look at it and uh, look at it from the perspective of uh, you can look at it from the perspective of the the uh, victims in this circumstance, and in many instances, I certainly do. My brother joined the military five months before 9/11, and now he's dead. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Uh, but anyway, oh, here it is. Oh. 
2003, uh. They got us out here in Baghdad, life is hard. Got us pulling fucking two hours of guard. Then they ump it up to eight between 12. I don't give a fuck, I think I'm stuck in hell, uh. I'd rather be there instead of jail. Putting Baghdad on the map, what? send me my what? mail. There's not a moment of the day that go by that not a thought about Baghdad never crosses my mind. It made me who I am today. Going to a country where you don't know nothing. Knowing it's going down, knowing you're hearing the bombs and the gunshots. It's real now. Like you've been trained for it, they done told you about it. Now you're here. That's the worst. This is the famous shoot and cry trope where the media had to cope with the unjustified nature of the Iraq war by shifting the victims from the people killed to the soldier who did the killing. No, that's why I addressed the crying, uh, the shoot and cry trope immediately. That's one of the first things I did, which is that there are people who still continue to justify endless bloodshed, okay? That certainly are, uh, you know, they, they, see, they, they see the immediate consequences that it had on their fucking minds right and how it literally rattled their brain how it fried their fucking brain and they're upset they're upset because it fried their personal brains they're not upset about the human toll okay and then they end up continuing the american military machine they propagandize it they continue to send other people to do the same fucking thing uh ironically I had a lot of, uh, I, had a, I had a, you know, take about that with respect to Dan Crenshaw, Daniel Crenshaw that got me banned and about what happened to his eye and, and his injury, okay? I will not repeat it because I did get banned uh, for saying things, but he was literally doing that. He was sending other, uh, he was justifying sending other children, uh, you know, young boys and girls overseas while simultaneously, you know, sitting there with a fucking eye patch on his face. How did that get there? You know what I mean? Like, fuck you, dude. Uh, you piece of shit. Anyway, um, I can say that he's a piece of shit. I just can't say what uh, caused his eye uh, to, uh, what caused his eye injury. Okay, I can't say that. Um, but how did that got there is basically, you know, he went over there and uh, some things happened. Shit you can go through at the age that we was going through it. They're trying to hit the campfire. Someone smoking a cigarette in the shitters? <laughs> oh, shit! What are you gonna do when you get out of the army? Be a fucking rock star. Sometimes I remember, oh yeah, that's right, I went to Iraq. Now that I have a kid, sometimes I find myself thinking, is he gonna end up going to some war that ends up not doing any good for the world and receive a bunch of shitty care? <laughs> Bro, Wilf is a wild name. I, can, I, I wanted to overlook it, but I can't overlook that. That is a wild name, okay? Wilf? <laughs> Afterwards. Wilfred in Baghdad for a few days and then we were in a firefight. <laughs> Emma said, Woman, I'd like to fuck. <laughs> the Abu Hanifa mosque. And short it was just for totally Wilfred? No, short for woman, I'd like to fuck. That's what it's short for. Bizarre. Just you know, fucking gunfire everywhere. It's a couple of RPGs. And I was just thinking, What the fuck am I doing here <laughs> and that question never went away i don't know how to explain the war to myself and have yet to have any clear thought of like yes we actually made a difference there because we didn't at all there was no difference fucking made uh maybe for the worse the area i come from is uh very small not a lot of opportunities for people fresh out of high school so it's either community college or Go do something, travel the world, get paid for it, experience places like this. 
I had swore I'd never join the Army. I watched my brother come home all rigid when I was like 12, and I was like, no way. And then he called me, and he said, you watching this shit? And I said, what? He goes, turn on the television. And about 30 seconds after I turned on the television, the second plane hit. When that happened, one, I was mad, you know, it was just my fucking backyard. Um, but I immediately thought, you know, this is what I need to do. I need, I need to, to, to defend my, I just felt it. I just had to do it. I had to go join my brother. I had to be by his side. There was no way I was going to let my brother go into a war and me not be there. We'll keep one saw back here. Just know where your people are. We got the rear. So you need to start holding that like fucking me. That deployment was funny because. You never see interviews with people whose family members were killed by these guys? Fair. Also, um, here's one thing that I have to mention here. This isn't for you. If you're in this community, you're probably aware of the grossest parts of uh, the unjustifiable and brutal American invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, numerous other countries, okay? Um, this is for the liberals that are watching uh, that... that or maybe even conservatives that are watching that are like, oh, that, that see the human toll on the American side. So it can still play a role in getting people to understand that it is not good, that, that war is not good. It's like, it's like talking about the, the uh, dangers of white supremacy, not immediately on non-white people, but instead how white supremacy ends up impacting white people as well in a negative fashion, right? Do you get it? Like, you can sit there and say, well, hold on, what the fuck? Well, what about the real victims of white supremacy? Which is true. We talk about that all the time. But I think this is also another important part of it to cover um, that, like, you know, I, I use it. I use it all the fucking time. I talk about 12,000 active service members that died in the war on terror. Like, yeah, what did they die doing? They died literally fucking invading countries and, and killing a bunch of random uh, brown kids, right? They had nothing to do with anything, right? But ultimately, it's important to recognize that they died for no fucking reason. They died for the military industrial complex. So you craft an argument specifically towards the audience that you're talking to. And now, yeah, 22 v uh, vets every day on top of that uh, that came back and are, you know, uh, uh, committing suicide. It's an important... It's an important thing to mention, especially when, when, you know, I don't think people realize that there's literally vests with kill counts tatted on their body. Yes, I, I, I know, but we're not talking about those veterans anyway. Like the few founding fathers who objected to slavery, not because of the cruelty or dehumanization of Africans, but because of how, mess, how it messed up white people. I mean, that... But sometimes you have to, I will use any and every opportunity to get the message across that war is bad, okay? That there is no justification for it. If it, if it requires uh, people who don't care or consider Iraq, uh, the people of Iraq as like human beings, to see it from the perspective of like American citizens, the American economy being destroyed, I'm going to use that as a talking point as well because the ultimate goal is to stop people from uh you know engaging in this stop and and have a a more robust uh anti-war movement in this country which is you know very difficult but regardless uh, and it might never happen but regardless i will still do it okay there was no clear-cut mission the whole time you're wondering like what are we really doing are we really in combat are we not in combat who's actually the enemy now you're in Baghdad. Now you're in the heart of Ottomia. Now you're, now what? What was going through my mind was it was dark out and I couldn't see my fingers basically. I was hoping I still had my fingers. I couldn't tell where I was shot. I just knew my arm was numb. And I found out I had my fingers and I could move them. The doc came by and he was patching me up and we just had a, a shallow conversation about uh, you know, oh wow, man, you got shot. And I was like, yeah. And I think I was only 19 at that point. And to be shot in the first two weeks of a 16 month deployment was, was setting the tone to say the least. IEDs are the scariest. Gunfire and crap like that, that shit don't bother me, you know, it's whatever. But IEDs, 
They had that shit in garbage, man. And it could be anywhere. And you ride through the hood and you see a milk jug on the side of the road, but the milk jug look kind of cut or a trash bag. The trash bag look kind of ripped up. That's the shit that they will put the fucking bombs in. They were trying to fucking kick out a, a invading force. Fair is fair. You know what I mean? You had significantly better weapons. You had, you know, uh, all the military tactics. They were, fart- they were fighting a, a insurgent war. They were engaging in guerrilla warfare with, with whatever weapons and tactics they had. Your ass is about to get deported? Yeah, no. I mean, that is one element of uh, America being the dominating force is that, like, they allow you to say shit like that. I mean, they'll yell at you a lot. They yell at me a lot. Every time I talk about, a, a, you know, American imperialism in such uh, black and white terms. But, yeah. I don't see any wires, but it's on the surface. We found Coke cans with plastic explosives in them on the corner. And when you're walking around a neighborhood that's literally, I mean, trash up and down the streets, it's, you can't really tell where they are. You see us when we're going around corners, and there's a box on the side of the road. It's just, you know, cringe and take the turn. And hopefully you don't hear a bang. I still cringe when I pass garbage. I still, I ask my wife, she goes nuts. I avoid garbage like the plague on the road. I will swerve my car to the other side. She's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? We're riding in the open tailgate of a truck and people are getting fucked up all the time. And we'd still go out there with it. Part of our $87 billion budget <laughs> provided for us to have some secondary armor put on top of our thin-skinned Humvees. Sorry. Ironically, they, they also would never have armor underneath, right, until recently. Armor was made in Iraq. It's high-quality metal, and it will probably slow down the shrapnel so that it stays in your body instead of going clean through. And that's about it. When we first got here, they were waving at us, uh, and next minute, as soon as we drive by, we'd get shot at. And or some days they'd look at us mean and you know give us gestures that they didn't want us there. And when I first got there, I noticed a lot of people doing this to me. Fuck you. Fuck you, American. They didn't say fuck you. They were just... And about four months into it, my interpreter looks at me and goes, Sergeant Beatty, have patience. Wait, what? Have patience. We hit houses with the wrong address. And then we'd have to apologize because we just kicked your door in or we just blew your door in or we just damaged your house at three o'clock in the morning. You know, Sahari, oopsie, we killed your child. She was standing in the way between us and, uh, you know, our, our target. Yeah, do it right here, do it right here. Hold your hand, hold your hand, hold your hand. Stay on to the front, stay on to the front. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get down. 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 And the psychological side of it, now, I still carry. Note, note how the U.S. has imported these methods back to America for policing? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, uh, long-range acoustic devices originally were implemented by the Defense Department uh, and utilized in Iraq against uh, dissenters, right? Big crowds. 
Now they are utilized in Portland and uh, everywhere around the country, as a matter of fact. Anything that goes out there will eventually be imported back here. Uh, AR-15s, okay, weapons created for warfare so that, uh, you know, the American military machine could do the endless bloodshed overseas were created in so much surplus that maybe we can just sell it to uh, our own uh, people. You know what I mean? And there you have it. One of the many reasons why America has such a bad fucking gun culture, when you want to call it bad gun culture, is like that violence will inevitably come home. Okay? That trauma that you are implementing is always going to come home. And sometimes directly, like the military surplus uh, program that the uh, Pentagon created to max out uh, as we inflated the police budgets, uh, allowed every fucking dumbass, hick-ass town to have an MRAP. You know? But when you think about, like, uh, yeah, when you think about, like, the American, the militarization of the American police, understand that that is, you know, there's a reason for that. And, and you know, we wanted to make money. Uh, our, our important industries needed to keep making money, small arms and also weapons of war, okay? Uh, you know, bombs and all that good stuff. They have to go somewhere. Uh, once one of those wars are done or the weapons are outdated, we'll just uh, give it to the uh, police force. Hey. Yeah, you see that in the camera. I'm a journalist. You know that? Why? I still think about that guy. I still remember punching him in the face. When he was going for this, when I punched him in his fucking face. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there's his glasses right there. Cop. That's a cop. That's literally no different. Ironic, because he, uh, he is likely to be a victim of... of similar police action as a black man in America, but that is precisely how cops operate. This is nearly identical to what uh, Tyree Nichols' murderers were saying on camera, on, on each other's body cameras, if you remember. Violence begets violence, and that kind of imported fascism uh, ends up, uh, you know, that kind of that export, sorry, comes all the way back home. If you look and you put yourself in their place, how would you feel if you had someone kicking in your door and you as the man want to protect your family and me coming through the door with bad intentions? Because the intel that I received told me you were a bad guy. Just shut your mouth when you're out. Just shut your mouth. Hey, hey, shut up. Yeah, I know that. Shut up. Okay. I'm always going to carry that. And uh, I'm still working on that. Pick him up. He goes outside the wall. Just I thought I'm shut him up. Yeah. Not trying to be contentious here. Genuinely curious if you can explain the phenomenon in which the soldiers more commonly feel remorse than the police, or at least that's what's portrayed in the media. Um, I think by and large, they don't. There's a lot of fucking vets who are like, there's, there's varying degrees of, of, uh, you know, veteran remorse. Um, some of it is basically about like, uh, I, I think some of it is, is literally just like remorse because you just feel like, uh, you thought you were doing the right thing against the enemy that you dehumanized or that your spear is dehumanized. But like a lot of veterans basically complain about the lack of funding in the military. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a lot of elements in the, there's a lot of elements within the military that like, uh, they, they complain about with respect to just like, uh, how their personal safety was violated. Right. And that's what gets them to start thinking about for what reason did this happen to me? It's oftentimes like a very selfish way to start uh, the, the process. And many of them do not engage in the introspection to recognize that lack of funding Pepela or lack of funding Copium. Yeah, I mean, that is literally where it comes from. Yes. I think some of the main differences, though, is that 
because they're like literally fucking removed from the daily existence of like living in society, the the glaring inequality is maybe more apparent. At least from what I have, uh, at least from what I've seen from the vets I've spoken to that are like you know anti-war veterans now. There is that, like, that juxtaposition is way more glaring when you're literally invading a country that is, like, that has nothing and, and killing people or participating in the destruction and death of people that have done absolutely nothing to you, that don't know who you are. Whereas with American policing, white supremacist propaganda internally is, uh, you know, super commonplace. That reinforcement mechanism is also uh, constantly a part of your everyday existence. And on top of that, um, you know, you get to go home to your nice neighborhood at night and sleep with your wife and take care of your children if you want to and get beers with your boys on the weekends. Like, it's not, it's not as, uh, it's not as big as like a, like a juxtaposition as like a lot of veterans face. I think that's probably the reason. And then veterans also inevitably go back to being civilians in a lot of instances, whereas cops are still continuing. Okay. Cops are still continuing to be cops. As an Iraqi, I know that guy's coming back to another AK to go kill Americans. And that's why. That's what they didn't get when they disrespected a man in his way in Iraq. It doesn't go away. They have no remorse to kill them when they came back in two wars. They were basically turning civilians into fighters. Yes, we. I mean, we talked about this a lot. Uh, yes, a big part of a big part of of the reality that like the Taliban kept improving and increasing their numbers in Afghanistan, for example, was directly due to the unjustifiable American invasion. Because you're radicalizing people. If you can understand how, like, uh, living in the United States of America and, like, a place like fucking Ohio where industry is left can radicalize young white men or young men in general, you should be able to genuinely understand how much worse it is in fucking Fallujah, okay? Where you have a direct occupying force. You can put a face to the fucking villains. You know what I mean? I you want to talk to you. What is this? He's, he wants me to talk to Train. He said Train is down to talk. Yeah, I don't... I, I, I told him stay around for a little. How long you think? I don't know. Fuck. Um, no, I mean, I'm down. I'm down to talk to Train. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. But, like, I don't want to... I don't want to do it right now when I'm in the middle of this. You know what I mean? This is some serious shit. Yeah. There's a lot of Zoomers who weren't alive when America did the did the thing. And they need to learn. All right, let's continue. He's protecting for now. his house. He gets punched in the face, put it on his damn back, ends up in Abu Ghraib, and he's never going to get that time back. Oh, they sent him to Abu Ghraib, too. So I think about that. Well, it's not even that he's never going to get that time back. It's that, like, he's he's never going to be the same. You know what I mean? He's just like permanently fucked. I don't feel like I'm defending my country anymore. And that kind of sucks. And that's, that's the whole purpose when you're a kid to join the army. A lot of people lot. feel it's like, you know, defend your country. But we're not defending our country anymore. I know uh, we I haven't defended our country in a while. but I didn't agree with the Iraq war when I went in. I, I, was, I went in for Afghanistan. I joined to go fight in the mountains. I wanted to fight fucking, I, I wanted to fight the Taliban. Um, you know, unfortunately, once you join, you have no politics, your property. You know, you go where they send you. When I was 20, I thought we were invincible. We were kids. We were just invincible. We're going to go here, we're going to do this, and we're going to get out. And I tell people to this day, the day that I grew up was November the 1st, 2003. That was the day I grew up. I think that's the day we all grew up. <sighs> and you say that day, and it just... We just got the call over the radio and that one of our Humvees was engaged with some kind of RPG or IED, nobody knew what it was at first. It just hit and it hit hard. Our hubby was limping back to the to the compound. 
and then we're getting status reports just constantly. And then we all just kind of went on with what we had to do that night. And then we got up the next day, and they told us we had a 9 o'clock formation. Nobody told us as to why. And I lined up the whole battery. And the BC came out, and he was, he was already crying. He was really shook up, and we knew something was bad. And he told us that during the night that Lieutenant Colgan had died. Like I said, it's really interesting. Bro would have been a juicer today. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about with respect to, like, how people... Like, if they did this... Bro, if the New York Times... I mean, this is such a laughable comparison. But imagine the New York Times cutting... Like this for the Russian conscripts who are literally conscripted. Like they're forced to go to war in Ukraine. These guys were not, right? Poverty draft and all is one thing. But like, can you imagine the New York Times writing an article like this or, or covering a video essay like this about Russian 19-year-olds who were like, I don't fucking want to do this shit, but like I had to go because, you know, otherwise I was going to jail. And... It's interesting because there is truth to that as well, just like there's truth to what they're experiencing and what they're talking about, which is why war is bad across the board, okay? But as far as... Stop saying poverty la draft is a lie, okay? It's not a... If it was such a fucking lie, they wouldn't routinely and hungrily try to go to every fucking black and brown neighborhood to recruit, okay? And every poor neighborhood to recruit from. It's definitely not a fucking lie. I hate when people say that it's a lie. It's, it doesn't comprise the entirety of the military, especially in a country that has so much military culture at this point. Okay? It's not. It's upward social mobility. It's the, it's the promise of upward social mobility that you get. Oof. Never seen a recruitment office in West Hollywood just saying, yeah, I mean, there aren't, there's no, I don't think there's a recruitment office in Beverly Hills. I, I, there might be one in West Hollywood, probably not though. There isn't a recruitment office in Bel Air. They're not going to the fucking Bel Air High School. That's for the officers program. Okay. That's for the Navy officers program. That's so you can go to college and then, you know, uh, do the ROTC thing then become an officer, then you get to be protected from, like, all of the worst uh, aspects of this. Beverly Hills has an Air Force recruitment center. Uh, you know, doubt it. A doubtful that it's a, as effective, rather. Sorry. Oh, they have one in Westfield Mall? That makes sense, actually. More foot traffic from a, uh, not just rich people, but more foot traffic from everyone. But yeah, Air Force is also different, again. And we haven't even touched CIA black sites or Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, or a million other consequences of this useless evil war. Yeah. And you just, everybody's heads just went down. It was, you could hear the, the gasps and, and tears and a lot of people. I think most people really wanted to go out and just kill everybody after that. People talking shit on the Air Force by saying Chair Force, you'll be begging them the next time a balloon looks at you. True. People don't respect. People need to put respect on the Chair Force, okay? They are the slayers of balloons. Do you understand? It was the first death we had suffered in the battalion, and then we'd had people hurt, but no one had died yet. That's a really big thing to just grasp all of a sudden. This is one of the things you'll never forget. Several other people in our unit were killed. Lieutenant Saltz, PFC Moore, uh, Sergeant Major Cook was killed, um, Sergeant McKeever. Rest in peace, boys. I don't like talking about that shit. That shit is so fucking depressing, man. You just have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. 
Man. So what does it do to a generation of young people during these deployments? They become old. They are old young men. Yeah, I mean, I feel more grown up. I mean, I've changed a lot in the last, you know, year. You know, for people back in the States, it was just a year. You know, nothing really changed. They just got a year older. You know, for me, it was like... I think that's what's like most... Um, I think that's most uh, traumatic. And, and another glaring juxtaposition is that like... And this is a shared sentiment by a lot of active duty uh, combat veterans. Is that... They were there getting their fucking dicks blown off, sitting on top of a goddamn poppy field for no fucking reason in Afghanistan, while back home, their wives and girlfriends were getting fucked by uh, the neighbors, you know what I mean? And the calls weren't coming as frequently as they once did, and they slowly but surely started recognizing, oh, like, America moved on. Like, we're here, but back home, they just fucking moved on. You know what I mean? Yes, Jody, exactly. Oh, uh, they lost friends while the entire neighborhoods were leveled by radioactive metal or phosphorus. Brother, I'm not talking about that. Uh, of course, you're you're telling me, okay, you're telling me personally, uh, as, as someone who very much covers the other side, the real victims of war that never get uh, this care or consideration uh, most of the time. Uh, the one instance where we're talking about uh, people who were brain broken by uh, non-stop propaganda and at least recognize the severity of their actions. Like you're never going to, you're always going to, you're always going to run into uh, me telling you that uh, you're wrong. If you have no, if you have no uh, interest in like uh, someone who has done unspeakable, awful things. Okay. Um, as long as they recognize their wrongs and, and want to do better. You know, a lifetime, you know. I feel I've grown up 20, 30 years out here. And every day it was, well, I guess I'm just doing what I'm doing today so that I can get to tomorrow, so that we can get to our 365 days and leave. And then that changed. Then we stayed out there for a few more months. I think it was like 419 days that we were there. Maybe George Bush should fund my fucking guitar business. He owes me a beer, at least, at the minimum. The Iraqis are probably wondering how in the hell are they supposed to believe in a system that we forced fed them when our system doesn't even work. Going back to George Floyd. Two words, not okay. There's actually a picture of me in Time Magazine with my knee on a suspected terrorist's chest. It wasn't on his carotid artery. It was across his chest. All these shootings, not okay. Oh my God. Liberalism is literally fucking just... Bro, really? Really, dude? Really? You're talking about fucking putting a knee on some dude's chest while he's in his own house, while you invaded his country, and then saying, like, is he gonna, is he about to say, like, oh, even we, uh, as, as, like, combat veterans, like, knew what the rules of engagement were, you know? These uncivilized freaks that we were fucking breaking into their doors, we, we treated them with more humanity than the police treat us. Like, come on, dog. It's literally the same. It's one in the fucking same. Okay? Like, what, 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 what ethics are we talking about? There's no way. I hope he's not saying that. Oh, he's not. Okay, never mind. Okay, I, I'm so geared towards, like... Okay, he's literally comparing himself to fucking Derek Chauvin, which is an apt comparison. I am so fucking geared towards uh, assuming the worst when I see shit like that on the New York Times. I'm sorry. I hear... No, he's saying he was... Or is he actually... Wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to read this again. Yeah, he is saying that. 
He's saying like I did, uh, I did, uh, you know, better towards this guy who is a suspected terrorist than Derek Chauvin did to fucking uh, George Floyd. Terrorist with my knee. There is actually a picture of me. Okay. When our system doesn't even work. Going back to George Floyd. Two words. Not okay. I think he's saying both. Like, he's saying both are bad. He's saying what he did was wrong, while also simultaneously still saying, like, uh, what he did was, like, still less wrong than what uh, Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd. You know. A little bit of both. It's fine. It's, I mean, he recognizes that he was doing that. And he was, he's saying that he was praised and celebrated for it. Don't be a lip chatter right now, please. No, no, he is. He's saying that he's... He was praised and in the, on the cover of fucking uh, Times Magazine for what Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd in a, in a very different way. All these shootings, not okay. He's right. He's right. It is a part of the same system. like the Army too much because, I mean took both her boys and we're over here and you know she hates that but she's very proud and nothing beats it it's the greatest feeling in the world jason's bike was always affectionately known as the asshole because that was my brother When shit gets dark, you know, and you're thinking about ending it or whatever, you call someone. Jason was that phone call for me, and I was always that phone call for Jason. So it was hard for me when he did do what he did. You know, the first few months, or, and then he called. Why didn't he call me? And I don't have to answer. Yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, uh, like just like white supremacy ends up hurting white people, uh, uh, American imperialism hurts those who are its, uh, you know, jackbooted thugs. Let's be real. Join because you're propagandized. You think it's like the right thing to do. You join because you're angry. All that, uh, you know, hopped up on machismo shit. Like, oh, they fucking hurt us. They hit us. They hit us on U.S. soil. How dare they? And then they just fucking use that anger that you feel to point you in a direction, whichever direction that they uh, feel is the best for. Hassan Abi killed that vet with his comments. Okay, shut the fuck up. Yeah, I, my 9-11 comments is what it killed him. Uh, that's right. <laughs> It's odd because, like, the fucking New York Times cut this documentary when they are the ones who also, like, literally geared up everyone to go to war. Like, playing a very, very vocal role in both justifying uh, both invasions and simultaneously fucking... And, and simultaneously lying to the American public, lying internationally... And now they're like, look how sad they are. It's like, yeah, bitch, you did it. Like, you played a role in it. You know what I mean? Played a significant role so, in so, it. So, 